Welcome, everybody. It's so good to see you on a gorgeous Missoula night. You've come inside to do wonderful things, and I appreciate that. Uh, this, of course, is Trade-Offs, the Common Good and the Individual, hosted by Humanities Montana. I'm Ken Egan, Executive Director of Humanities Montana, and we are an independent nonprofit organization that provides programs and grants on history, literature, philosophy, civics, Native American cultures, and much, much more all over the state of Montana. And you have an unusual and wonderful opportunity tonight, first of all, to learn more about us because our beautiful annual report is available. It's hot off the press, and there are copies on the table as you came in. I encourage you to grab one, take a look at it. And in addition to that, the board and staff of Humanities Montana are here tonight, so you have an opportunity to visit one-on-one -on -one with individuals who have committed their hearts and souls to the humanities in Montana. So first of all, I want to ask all board members of Humanities Montana to stand to be recognized. All board members, please stand, and, and let's give them some applause. So these folks volunteer a lot of time and energy for the humanities, and I'm very sincere. Please try to visit with them one-on-one. -on -one. We also have the staff of Humanities Montana. These are the folks who put this event together and so many more events for Montana. So I want the staff of Humanities Montana to stand or wave your hand. So, um, we have some very special guests here tonight. We are participating in what's called a National Endowment for the Humanities site visit. And what that means is we, as an independent nonprofit, are affiliated with the National Endowment for the Humanities. And every five years, NEH puts at our disposal three gifted people who come and give us friendly collegial advice about how we can do our work for Montanans. And so I want to recognize these individuals. They've come a long way in some cases. So first of all, I want to recognize Meg McReynolds from Washington, D.C. Ron Pisaneski, did I say that right? Ron Pisaneski, Idaho. And Ron is actually the general manager of Idaho Public Television, so thanks oh, for being wow. here. And, yeah. Yay, Public TV, woohoo! And then we also have Francis McHugh, and I think many of you know Francis. Francis McHugh, yes, yes. A wonderful writer from Seattle who is a dear friend of Montana. If you don't know the book, The Car That Brought You Here Still Runs, Francis' brilliant tribute to Richard Hugo. Please go buy it. Not right now, but eventually. <laughs> go, go buy it. Yes, eventually. I do want to stress that NEH is celebrating its 50th anniversary as an incredibly important uh, outfit organization for the United States. And we're going to be hosting the chairman of NEH, William Bro Adams, in Bozeman, September 17 through 20. OK, just to say that again. We, Humanities Montana, will be hosting the chairman of NEH, William Bro Adams, in Bozeman, September 17 through 20. So please join us for that. It's going to be a lot of fun. He's very energetic. And you might have guessed, he's very committed to the notion of the common good. So he's a very, very important figure for that. Now, tonight we have organized this event in part to celebrate, to acknowledge, to kind of elevate the profile of one of the core commitments of NEH, and that is a commitment to the common good. And so NEH has introduced over the last several months some new grant opportunities, and what I want to emphasize tonight is the staff of Humanities Montana is committed to helping Montanans apply for and get that money. No pressure may. <laughs> We want to bring more NEH dollars directly to Montana through these amazing initiatives. And what is the common good about? It's about demonstrating why and how the humanities matter 
to public life in this country. And I think we all agree that's absolutely true. And NEH is committed to demonstrating it. So they've introduced a new fellowship or scholarship line committed to public humanities work. And so a number of Montanans I'm aware of have applied for that funding. They've introduced just recently a new grant line called uh, Humanities and the Public Square. And so I'm encouraging folks to think about applying for that deadline of June 24th. But really, I, I can't stress this enough. I believe we have so much talent in this state. We should have more of those NEH dollars. And so I hope you'll uh, work with the staff. And I mean that. Talk to Kim, talk to Sam, talk to me, talk to Jason, and talk to Debbie. And we will help you to at least work on that. So please, please, please do that. All right, now I get the pleasure of introducing tonight's moderator. And in a sense, it seems redundant to introduce this individual. Uh, he's been with Montana Public Radio and Montana Public Television for, I'm going to say, approximately 40 years. I'm not going to name a specific number. But let's just say he's been pretty active for a while. He was also, I have to say, a board member and chair of Humanities Montana and really was a wonderful, wonderful advocate, continues to be a wonderful advocate for our work, so a deep thanks to him for that. You probably know that he's going to retire as of June 30th, and so he's on the cusp of that big moment, that transition. So please join me in welcoming, as our moderator, William Marcus. <laughs> Thanks, Ken, and thank you for coming, and thanks to Humanities Montana for asking me to moderate this interesting uh, conversation. And it will be a conversation, not only us here, but after that, at your tables, you will be asked to talk to each other about this issue, because after all, it is about the individual and how we fit into the common good. And we're going to try to illustrate some of those challenges here with our panelists, but I think most of what you'll take away from this event is going to be what you share and learn from the people at your tables. So, um, I'd like to uh, read from the uh, speech that the chair of, of the National Endowment, uh, William Adams, gave at the National Press Club, introducing the common good concept. And after talking about all of the initiatives, all the issues, he says this, the result is not the sudden disappearance of the things that vex us, but a deeper understanding of who we are, how we got here, and how we might lead better lives. We never get to the bottom of things, but sometimes we get wiser. So we're not here to solve problems. We're not here to solve issues. We're here to get wiser. We're here to learn and reflect together. And um, we have three wonderful panelists to help us do that. And I will do that horrible thing of staring at my iPod because that's, that's where I put this together. So here are the introductions. <laughs> Julie Kajun is a member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes, has been working in education for 19 years. A former classroom teacher, Kajun has worked on culturally responsive educational materials for the National Science Foundation, NASA, the Montana Historical Society, and numerous other entities. She recently completed a three-year project developing tribal history materials that was funded by the Montana State Legislature. After working at Nakusum, the, San the Salish Language Revitalization Institute as the Director of Development and Teacher Supervisor for a year, Kajun was awarded a $1.4 million grant from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation to continue work on the development and publication of tribal history materials. The Kellogg grant is based at Salish Kootenai College. In 2002, she received the Milken National Educator Award in fall of 2009. The Utney Reader listed Kajun as one of the 50 visionaries who are changing our world. Julie Kajun. <laughs> Mike Halligan was raised in Billings. 
He enlisted in the U.S. Army and served in Vietnam as an infantry combat platoon leader with the 101st Airborne Division. In 1975, Halligan completed a Bachelor of Arts degree in History and Political Science at UM. He received a master's degree in public administration in 1977 and graduated from the University of Montana School of Law in 1984. Halligan served in the Montana State Senate from 1980 to 2002. He has been director of government and corporate relations for Washington corporations and executive director of the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation since November of 2002. The Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation strives to better the human condition by supporting programs and services that give people the tools to enhance the quality of their lives and to benefit society as a whole. Mike Halligan. <laughs> Mayor John Engen was scheduled to be here tonight, but uh, there, because of a death in the family, he is unable to join us. Bruce Bender stepped in and is a, a great substitute for the mayor. He said he won't be as funny as John. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I won't even try. <laughs> Bruce worked for the city of Missoula, serving the public for nearly 32 years. He spent the last 10 years as the chief administration officer for the city, running the city on a daily basis, nuts and bolts level, until he retired last Friday. <laughs> so, how's that feel? <laughs> well, I was rather surprised I'm here tonight, put it that way. <laughs> this was a panic call. <laughs> he also worked as city engineer and the director of public works. He worked for and advised six mayors and worked with 74 council members. <laughs> Before he came to Missoula, he worked for the city of Helena in public works and engineering for five years. Bruce is an engineer who also earned an undergraduate degree in psychology and a master's degree in public administration. During his time in Missoula, Bruce was responsible for improving protection of our water quality with great expansion of the city's sewer system and its wastewater treatment plant, not without protest from some members of the public. <laughs> His most recent role was on the city team working to acquire Missoula's water system and spent an entire day on the witness stand during that trial. Bruce Bender. What I'd like to do is ask each of our panelists to give an example of a moment in their lives when they had to make this decision between their personal individual interest and the public good. I'd like to start with you, Julie. Okay. Well, I had to think a long time. I don't know that I'm that altruistic a person, but um, I, I was a newly single parent and I went home uh, to the, the reservation, my reservation home, um, after completing all my coursework for my elementary ed degree. And I wanted to be around family. And while I was there, I got a call from a principal of one of the schools. And she had written a grant for a bilingual program. And she wanted me to apply for the job. And I said, well, I am not interested in that job because I'm not planning to move home. I'm going to Bozeman. And I, for one thing, I haven't even done my student teaching. And I was. Um, already set up with a progressive school in Bozeman. My sister was teaching um, at MSU, and Bozeman teacher's salary was like $6,000 more than Lake County. And, and I had really made the decision, um, both you know, for my kids going to school there, um, and so I had made that choice. But she's a very persistent woman. Um, her name is Terry O'Fallon. And she said, well, would you just come in and talk to me about the job? And so out of respect for her, um, I went in and, and visited with her. And she said, well, I said, first of all, you know, I need to know kind of what, what it, and she said, well, you'd be teaching some Salish and, you know, some tribal history and 420 kids and there's no curriculum and <laughs> you won't get paid for two months because you're not a real teacher yet and you don't have a classroom. So you'll be in the hallway, um, 
with two lunch tables, and no materials, and you have to go through a rigorous interview with the Salish and Padre Culture Committee. And I was like, wow, great. Yeah. And, and I said, well, I maybe know 10 Salish words, you know, honestly, una, you know, I, I can count to 10. I, I said, I really don't know. You know, I, ha I don't speak the language. She said, don't worry, we'd have a, a fluent speaker that would work with you, you know, be in the classroom with you. And, and I said, well, you know, I don't, you know, who is on the culture committee now? And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, all the elders. And, and it, it was, I guess, a, a moment in time when you're kind of faced with yourself, you know, and it's always hard for us to face ourselves and our fears. And, you know, in retrospect, I kind of believe it, it was destiny, but it was like I had to face who I am, you know, as a tribal member, um, what, what my cultural identity is, what my cultural knowledge is, and do I want to come home and work in my community? And, and I, I said, aren't there any, any other Indian teachers? And there, there really weren't. There had been um, some people that went into teaching and they left very quickly. And so I was, at the time, one of a few um, in my community that had a teaching background. And so I, what, I guess what I experienced is, is the reality of thinking about what does it mean to be a tribal member. And it means a lot more than what you know, or, or if you speak the language, it means what commitment you actually have to be a citizen and a member of that community, and, and what you're willing to give to that community. You know, because one of our most important values is reciprocity, and in a traditional educational system, you were raised to become a reliable person and a good human being so that your community was better and, and benefited from the gifts that you brought, both personally, spiritually, intellectually, and physically. And so I thought about all of that and, and the really clear message that the people in my family gave to all of us as we were growing up is that you need to do something that makes a difference and that everybody in our family was expected to do something that was good for the community, but I really hadn't planned to do that. And, and so I had to face number one myself and find out, what, well, what do I really know? When you teach something to somebody, you find out what you really know about it. And so I made a really quick trip inside to what I knew, and it was a really quick trip, and I was like, I don't know a lot. And so it, it was a little bit frightening, you know, that there was a, a bit of fear and, and there was some sense of shame and then a little bit of questioning, why don't I know more? And, and yes, I grew up with this huge extended family and all of these cultural values, but what specific knowledge did I have that I could share with children? And, and how is the culture committee going to vet me? You know, and that, that was a frightening thought, too. But, but I knew, even though consciously I was shaking my head no to her in this meeting, I, I knew that really that I had to do that, that it, that it was something that I had to do, and that if I walked away, um, that that would have been wrong. And, and so, so I did it, and it ended up being a, a remarkable thing for me, for my life. I think my children paid a cost in the education that they got, and then I was drawn into a huge controversy, you know, and they had to deal with that socially with their peers at school. And so for me, it was great. Um, I, I think my kids, you know, paid something for it, but, but I guess that's really the only personal example that I could think of, William. And it's such a, a, a wonderful example because what I hope everybody comes away from this conversation with is that when you make that individual sacrifice, which seems a sacrifice at the beginning, in the end the payback really does bring something back to you as an individual, that you are 
you, your sense of self is different, and you've grown because of that. So. Yes, yes, and things, I, I, I went on a journey that I would have never traveled on as an educator mm -hmm. had I not made that decision. And so, um, I'm, in retrospect, I, I'm happy that, and I don't think it was that I had all this personal character, you know, or, or strength or fortitude. I really think it was thinking of my family, my mother and my uncles and, and my relatives, and what they would, their expectation and what they would think was, was very important to me. Thank you. Thank you. Bruce, you have worked in civic life and running government, but I noticed that the degree in psychology, that there was kind of a different path at the beginning. What's, what do you have to share? Well, it, it, it's quite a, uh, a route when I was in college that basically I was, I, I was always good in sciences and, and uh, so I was enticed into the chemical, chemical engineering field because the, uh, the department had, had been very effectively drawn in um, a lot of students in Montana, Montana State uh, with scholarships and he'd gotten it through uh, a lot of the, the corporations of the United States or whatever. So uh, I knew I could do it well so I entered that and so I was riding down the road of being a chemical engineer and, until my uh, junior year I worked with American Oil Company. In fact I was looking at my, uh, some of my old files. I wrote a, a five page uh, paper uh, to the company about how they were mistreating their employees. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I was already starting to have a high sense of, uh, of uh, that this was not an area I wanted to be in. And I also had a high sense that chemical engineering was not uh, leading the, 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 the concerns about the environment. And, uh, and so I kind of had a social, a social conscious awakening, even though I, was, I look back and think about I was always very, you know, coming from a, a large family, a farming community, I was very conscious of community. In high school and high, in college, I was very conscious of serving. I was always on student government, I was in clubs, whatever. But here I was headed down this corporate uh, area. They, they gave me a job and I, and I said, no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to work in, the, in fact, one of my classmates came in and he's a multimillionaire. I just recently met him. So I, I could have gone on that pathway. Chemical engineers are, are kind of the corporate uh, and boards and stuff like that. But uh, what happened to me was really more of a social conscious awakening, a spiritual awakening. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I realized that I wanted to be more social service. So when I got my degree in, in psychology, and then, uh, and, then, and then, believe it or not, it worked in the Catholic Church. I was, I was going to uh, work in the church, but one of the things, I had a high interest in marrying, and so I realized that that was not gonna work out, so I, <laughs> I, I, moved, I moved on rather quickly on that. And uh, so then I was gonna be a social worker because I wanted to serve. And, and actually, accidentally started working for the city of Helena and realized, Oh, you know, you have this technical background, you have this capability, and, and they're very socially service-minded. And so I, I kind of made that move, and, and I started uh, working for the city of Helena, and then fortunately I uh, was able to work here in Missoula. You know, so it, it became one of, I wanted to be you know, serving socially, but I also had a sense that I had a very technical ability, and, and I wanted to bring those skills uh, to it. And so. It, it, all of that background really served me extensively because you, if you don't know a lot about people, you wouldn't be successful. There's a lot of engineers I knew that were not successful in city government because they weren't conscious of the public dynamics, the process. And, and so, I, you know, my being, uh, having that social consciousness helped me a lot. Thank you. Anyway. Mike, your experience in Vietnam in the in the military, your experience in politics as a senator there. Um, can you share some some story of maybe an intersection of those two worlds? Certainly, and maybe to do that, I need to lay a little pipe just a little deeper, and I'll try to make it brief so we don't get bored here. <laughs> so I was a pretty bad student in high school real bad student in high school. <laughs> my counselor called me in the senior year and said I had wasted my high school career. 
and that the only place that I was going to end up was Vietnam, and that would be the best place for me, according to her. So I sold shoes for my father after graduation at, in the middle of my class, uh, it's a little above a C plus, no, a C to C plus, somewhere in there, and knew that that was not a path that, that I wanted to follow selling shoes. And all my friends had gone to college. We couldn't afford to have me go to college, so the only alternative for me was the service. So you know, John Kennedy had issued his, you know, what can you do for your country about seven or eight years before that. There were, the Vietnam War was raging, all the social, economic, political turmoil was going on. I was largely oblivious to a lot of that. As just a kid coming out of high school, I, I didn't pay much attention, if at all. But I enlisted and went over to Fort Lewis, basic training, and I happened to score high enough on the exam where they said that I could go to officer candidate school instead of the, uh, being an NCO. And so I went to officer candidate school and I had enlisted to be a Green Beret. And so I went to officer candidate school, I came out, I was assigned to a Green Beret unit in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and I'm 19 years old and I get my orders for Vietnam, and again, I am still someone naive and not paying attention to really anything, particularly perhaps the Constitution or anything that's even related or remotely to it. I get to Vietnam in uh, Thanksgiving Day in 1969, and I spent a couple of nights with other platoon leaders in the infantry going out on the search and destroy missions to get the feel for it. And then I went to my company commander in the, in the field and said, I'm ready to go to my platoon. And um, he says, oh, I got a call, go meet your platoon yourself. It's one of those extremely gray, drizzly, monsoon days that on the, the, the grayest of a day, walking out on a plank with the mud on, on both sides, I come to my platoon and there's the, the biggest African-American guy and the biggest white guy fighting in the mud as I go greet my platoon. <laughs> and I'm 19 years old. Most of them were 19 years old as well. <laughs> so I, I had to begin to awaken to the issues that I had not even been exposed to in Billings, Montana, particularly the prejudice issues. So as I became more mature as the platoon leader during that experience, one of the things that awakened me was sitting in the hooches during the, the days we would ambush at night, listening to the inner city African-American young men from Detroit and Chicago and New York and San Francisco talk about the homelessness and the poverty and the hunger and the, the, the violence and the prejudice that they, and I, I'm thinking, I don't know that America. What, 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 what. You know, so it, it, and then I started to read and I started to awaken and I started the fire in the belly to say, all right, something is wrong here. Some politicians, politicians put us in a place that we didn't need to be and I needed to do something about it. So make that, that change in my life. So I come back and I did, I managed to run for office, I'm finishing degrees, a bachelor's degree and master's degree, and lost three elections before I finally got into the, into the legislature. And a couple years in, four years in, in fact, uh, there's a bill in the legislature that uh, is going to make flag burning a crime. You know, and I am a veteran, and all the veterans were in the audience. And, I mean, an audience out in the hallways. And they expected me to vote for that bill. Actually, it was a resolution to petition Congress to, to, have, to do a constitutional amendment. You know, there may be people in this audience who are going to disagree with what I'm about to say, but I had to decide, did I stand for the First Amendment? Did I stand for something broader than, than the parochial interests, the self-interests of me wanting to get to run for office again, and I needed those veterans to be able to run again? Or what did I stand for? So, I mean, it was young in my political career that I had the opportunity then to not do the right thing on the second reading vote, which is the debate stage vote. But I listened to Chet Blaylock, and some people in the audience will remember him, long-term time teacher in Laurel, Montana, gave the most eloquent First Amendment speech you could ever give on the floor of the Senate. And despite that, I still voted to, you know, the wrong way. And I had to wait until the third reading vote 
to be able to, to change my vote and tell my seatmate who was carrying the bill that, that I had to finally take a longer term vision here. I had to take a broader look of what this bill meant to, to, to rights that I had fought for, that I was only, that I thought I began to appreciate, but only beginning to appreciate the depth of those rights and, and how I could affect those uh, as a public policymaker in the Montana legislature. So uh, having to, to, actually I had to get up on the floor and do a motion to change my vote which is always singles you out when you do that, as, as other people will know. And uh, I mean, if the vote's tied, you can't change the vote, but it, it wasn't in that case. So it was, a, it was a test for me as to what was I gonna stand for, and then for the rest of my political career, and I will say this to you now, I think I was the first Democrat to probably vote for a sales tax. Now don't, don't throw anything, please, you know? <laughs> you know? But I was chairman of the committee. I thought we'd crafted a bill that, that really was a balance between all the interests involved, and I was determined to do the right thing if I felt it was the right thing. Everybody said, I'm gonna get unelected, and I was elected four more times. But, so at least it, it gave me the guts, the spine, the, whatever the intestinal fortitude, to be able to withstand that pressure that we all get from our constituencies, you know, when we should be doing the right thing as opposed to the political correct thing. So, that, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Those are some uh, profound personal stories. And when you consider what your personal story is, what you have given up for common good, I'd like the panelists to talk a bit about what that means exactly. What does common good mean in a country that is based on pluralism and the individual and that we each have our own rights? How does that meld with something that we all could agree on as common good? I mean, what if a chemical engineer who is a millionaire is sitting here and for him, is it wrong that he went that path? Is that against the common good? Or was Bruce's path the common good? Where, where does that come together in a, in a way that we can agree on? And of course, I said we weren't going to solve anything. But to just think a little deeper about it, what, is, what does common good mean to each of you? Well, you know, I, I think it's easier for me to think about common good because I'm an Indian <laughs> and that's what we do. And, and part of that... What, what do you mean by that? Well, because there's still a, a, a really strong sense of community that I think is lost in our country. You know, there are some neighborhoods, but I think people long for community and belonging and to feel that you're a part of something and that you have this group of people that you may disagree with and argue with and gossip about and fight with, but you still love each other. And, and when it comes down to it, that you really have each other's back. And so there, there's a sense in Indian country, everywhere I go, that that's still really strong. And, and so that you are a part of a group and that you know, if we go back generationally, it was always thinking about um, what was good for the group, and our leaders weren't, you know, people might not agree with a leader, and I'm talking about Salish people, and, and, they, and if they didn't agree with him, then they didn't go along with what he wanted them to do. So there was an idea of being able to build consensus, you know, among people. And, and, and having that really strong sense of community. And I think that came from thinking into the future because sometimes I think what prevents us from being able to really embrace the common good is, is that we're not being able to see down the road what's gonna happen with chemical, you know, with GMOs and what's gonna happen with fracking you know, with the water, water is such a big issue. It's, it's that people have gotten to living in this immediate fast food present day, I want it now. It's like if I can't see um, an impact on my own life in the immediate, then I'm less likely 
to embrace that. And then I think the lack of a sense of community. But, but I think that people are really hungry for that. And I really see that with young people, that when I talk with young people in schools, that, that they want to talk about that. And they want to think of these issues that we're talking about, something larger than them, that I'm just going to go out and I'm going to get a degree and have a job, but that I want to, I'm going to leave here and I'm going to do something important that, that's meaningful. Your use of the phrase hunger for mm -hmm. To me, implies that that they're still um, they still are looking for it. Is it a lack of, of leadership? Is it a lack of someone who will set an example and and help us understand how to get there? I I think that's part of it. I talked to some students at Northern Michigan University, and I asked them. I said, "What are your causes?" So it was like a couple hundred college students. And, and I, I was trying to work them up. And I'm like, well, what about climate change? So I was throwing things out. And they're like, well. And they said, well, you guys had like Gandhi. And it's like, I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> you guys had like Gandhi and Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and, and all those guys to look up to. And, and who have we got? Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that, that people are looking for, that young people are really looking for heroes. And, and, that, and that they're looking for heroes of substance that, that have personal integrity, not just people that are, are nationally known, but, but people that have um, a, a spiritual quality, and, and I don't mean that denominationally, but that it's lived out in their life. And that's what I find young people talking about, talking about ethics and talking about that meaning and looking for people who are those people? Where are those people? And, and, and what are they doing? And, and they need to be connected with those. Because I think those people are out there. I, I just think we don't always know who they are. They're, they're quietly going about remarkable things. Bruce, you have worked under seven mayors. You haven't been the politician out front, but you've been the person behind there. And as you have looked at someone in a leadership role as a politician, as the mayor, what has made a difference in bringing together a sense of common good? What has worked and, and what hasn't? Well, you know, I was very fortunate to, to work with uh, Mayor Dan Camus that, uh, in my early years, and, and he helped me understand, and the community understand, uh, what a city should be all about, and, and that uh, and that what uh, and that citizenship and governance, what that should all be about, and in his what what I felt my job was was his his purpose was, you know, um, half of our city, uh, uh, half of the urban area was not in the city limits, and from me from the uh, the engineering perspective of the water quality, half of our community were not on public sewer but were on septics, and this was all in the 80s, and and so. From my perspective, I, I could clearly understand uh, Mayor Kemos was saying, he, uh, his view was that the, the, the people of the urban area should be under the city government, be part of the city. And, and, uh, and from my perspective, this dense urban area should be on public sewer. Um, and so I took that task on uh, uh, as the city engineer and public works director to uh, uh, bring um, the community together basically in the context of protecting our drinking water um, and and so my job basically was to convince um, under, under the leadership of the, the mayor and the council to convince the public that um, you know uh, we need to protect our drinking water uh, and you're gonna have to pay for it <laughs> and uh, <laughs> And yet we, we brought and we recognized that wasn't going to work, so we had to talk about, well, the good of this, the common good of that is that maybe the whole city should start paying for it. And actually, Mayor Kemis was came up with this idea that, well, let's bring our own resources to it. And so we did bring out a package, and it was the start. Uh, it was actually the Wapakia Bellevue area was, was the start of expanding the, the sewer system, but also then the annexation, and then East Reserve and Linda Vista, and then eventually the Rattlesnake area too. But uh, from my perspective, you, you, uh, you know, you're, you're dependent on your elected uh, officials to give uh, 
a, a big view of it. Um, and, uh, and I've just been fortunate to, uh, to work with uh, uh, Mayor Chemis, and Mayor Cadis, and Mayor Ng, and, and they all had that big view of uh, wanting to provide uh, the common good to the city. And, 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 and my job was to uh, implement that in a sense of uh, wastewater, but also uh, the, you know, the, the community's value was protecting the river. Um, and so it was not only simply collecting wastewater, but also let's, it's, it's, it's treat the river well. You know, and it always shocked me in a sense of our community values that in the 60s we were dumping raw sewage into the Clark Fork River. Um, this facility right here would have been dumping raw sewage right into the Clark Fork. You know, we are pretty young in, in protecting our river, but we have come unbelievable. You know, we removed this uh, huge uh, pond above us with all that uh, monster waste in it. We have, uh, now we have a treatment plant that the quality of our treatment is we, we put out very little nutrients. So, you know, we've come a long ways uh, in those, uh, those years of uh, 50 years plus. And, uh, um, and, and, you know, the thing that I was always uh, amazed with coming here uh, was the perspective that um, there were always significant individuals on the council, um, in, in the public, uh, elected officials, that really saw the importance of uh, the, the qualities here. I mean, uh, the other aspect that I was involved in was air quality issues. Um, you know, we had uh, malfunction junction, it was a stigma that hung around our necks and we were, uh, had carbon monoxide uh, non-attainment levels. And, and, uh, and at the same time, we were trying to deal with our, our wood stoves. And we were same time. I came here uh, in the 70s, and you, know, you couldn't believe uh, you know, the stench you would have to put up with, with, with uh, Smurf and Stone and whatever that was coming out of that period of time. Um, and, uh, and yet, look how, I mean, some people would be shocked to know how far we've come as a community in improving our air quality, but we've also come a long ways in improving our water quality too. Mm -hmm. And just re reflecting on some of the, the things I've been reading, there's that, that is a, a sense of common good. Um, there are other people who regret the loss of Smurfit Stone because of mm -hmm. the jobs right. and the quality of life that it provided for families. Mm -hmm. So there's always that trade-off there. Mike, Bruce talked about the word resources. And as the executive director of the Phyllis and Dennis Washington Foundation, uh, you are in a position to look at applications where people are trying to create common good. And the foundation itself, I think, is, is reaching out, especially in education for children and young people, to create a, a better life, a better common advance for folks. So if you, I don't know if you want to talk from the, the foundation uh, standpoint of all the requests that you get, how do you sift out through there what is going to result in common good for the communities and the state of Montana and the region. Thank you. Let me figure out how to answer that without answering that question. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll give you, no. Well, let me answer my favorite, it. My favorite kind of guest. <laughs> still be a politician. So <laughs> let me answer it with a, with a quote from Jesse Jackson, you know, that leadership isn't just a matter of choosing sides, it's bringing sides together. So that's going to get to the point that William made in a second. So when I watch the legislature and watch uh, the public officials you know, stand up on the floor and give their impassioned speech and the vote is taken and they lose and that's it. You know, That's not the way it happened, I don't think, back when Dan and I were serving and I think that's not the way it's supposed to happen. In my opinion, and what I think Jesse Jackson went on to say is that's when leadership begins is after you've lost that vote. Now you've got to go find that middle ground, that common ground. And I think that's what we have kind of lost with term limits, we've lost with gerrymandering of districts, we've lost with the, a, a lot of different ways the system has been changed that don't allow the relationships to be built so that you can have a, a dialogue about that. So 
fast forward then to my role in the, in the foundation, what, what Dennis and Phyllis have a passion for doing, you know, is trying to give people the tools to succeed, you know, in life. You know, so we don't do golf scrambles, we don't do one dayers, two dayers, or three dayers. We do long-term investments in programs, and mostly involving kids. So we have about 400 kids going to school and scholarships and higher education. That's that investment that Dennis and Phyllis are very passionate about. And then early childhood, after school, things that, that will allow a family to come out of the program that they're in and have some understanding of how to take that forward in some sustainable way. So when I get a grant request in from a Boys and Girls Club or a YMCA or a YWCA and they want to do a summer camp to, to maybe do something you know, around uh, arts and STEM and, and those kinds of things, I, as a foundation executive, now because I know we have not moved the needle as a society on poverty and homelessness and hunger and all those issues that we have been working on for 50 years, we haven't hardly made a dent. So my job is to not do business as usual. So I need to, how do you do that? I've got to get the parents involved, I've got to get the community involved. So when I'm looking at that grant application, no matter how small it is, from $5,000 to $500,000, I'm finding out who is involved and how can I drive that that program to a place that I know they can make a difference. So if it takes more money on our part to make that happen, my job is to do that. And I gave an example earlier today about a, a, a living water evangelical church in Billings, Montana. You know, we rarely do face-based giving, but this was a program to simply do bike repair for the 20 or so kids that they had in their parish on the south side of, of, of Billings. That's the poor side of town. That's where I grew up. I know that. And so I, I'm trained to recognize a good idea when I see it. So I got on the phone and called that number, and Rhoda, the pastor's wife, elderly woman, answered the phone, and all the CEOs I talk to and applicants have passion to do lots of very good things. I know that passion is there. So I said, Rhoda, how can I explode this idea? This is a great idea. You give a kid a bike, you give him freedom to go to the library and the parks and all those places. So let's, let's work together to see how we do this. She says, well, I really don't, I've only got a couple people in the parish I'm working with, and, you know, we've got some, some chains donated and some other tires and some spokes and things like that, you know. And I said, well, listen, if you go to them, and, and then go to the civic clubs, let's go to the civic club, the Lions and the Exchange Club and the Rotary, and you tell them for every volunteer they'll give you, I'll give you $250. For every $500 they'll give you, or any amount of money, I'll match that as well. So I had to put my money where my mouth was, try to get to that broader common good that I know they were trying to get to. So to make a long story short, working with Rhoda, spending no more than $5,000 a year, having her go out, present to those exchange clubs, I knew they couldn't say no to her once they got her in front of them, and then I said, go to the hospitals, get all the helmets donated, do all this stuff, whatever. Talk to the police, talk to the fire, talk to the National Guard. Well, in Billings, 1,200 kids, three parks. It's the signature program in Billings, Montana, to be able to work you know, four kids. And now you've got kids that have been trained to fix bikes, doing the, the repair, you know, four other kids and teaching them. So all I needed to do was tap the passion of somebody to have the common good in Billings, Montana, kind of come together in a community way. So it's, it, that's what I get to do for a living. It's a great job to be able to do that. And part of also what I get to do, and I know that I'm past my time, is I know Dan Kemis is working on areas that, that have to do with philanthropy, trying to, to strengthen democracy. That, you know, we've seen a lot of dysfunction at that, that federal level. And so I think it's up to people like us and nonprofit leaders to be able to say, listen, if, if the federal government isn't going to work, we know the state and the local government they can work, and we can work with them. So how can philanthropy help provide summits, provide dialogue, bring people together to see how we can get things solved without having to worry so much about what happens at that, that higher level that we may not be able to control, but we can control our own destiny. So we're not throwing our hands up. We're investing in those kind of programs that will bring the community together you know, with using us and not pointing the finger at anybody else. So. We could talk for another hour up here. Um, but the important part of this uh, event is what's going to take place next. Uh, there are facilitators at every table who will lead you through these discussions about the individual and the common good. I'm going to 
come and sit at your table and listen and take some notes and try to synthesize that in five minutes at the end. Um, but I want to thank our panelists, Julie Kajun, uh, Bruce Bender, and uh, Mike Halligan for, um, for taking the time to think hard, to take us deeper and make us wiser. Um, and just recognizing former Mayor Dan Chemis, I worked with Dan on a radio show a long time ago called Habits of the Heart. And um, what I took away from that is that, and I think it applies here too, is that when you speak in these conversations, it's what you're talking about, is what is in your heart, what you are passionate about. You know, we're all here because we want common good. We want a better community. We want uh, tomorrow to be better for all of us and for our children in the next generations. So thank you for being here and making that effort. And uh, we'll see what you all come up with. <laughs>